Hi, my name's Siobhan Lancaster, and I'm the CEO and Managing Director of 92 Energy. 92 Energy is a uranium exploration company. We recently listed on the ASX in April of 2021, and we're exploring for high-grade, unconformity-related uranium in the Athabasca Basin of Canada. Siobhan, good to have you on the show. Um, been trying to um, get, get you on um, for a, a while now, because I was really intrigued. Aussie company in Athabasca Basin, always interesting. Um, let's start with you, though. What's, what's your background? Sure. So I was actually around in the last uranium cycle. I worked for Extract Resources. Um, and Extract, you might remember, had uh, the Husab uranium deposit. Uh, so that was the third largest uranium only discovery uh, in the world at the time. And I was the company secretary of corporate affairs for the company. So I was with them from uh, just after they'd made the discovery all the way through to the sale process. So I was heavily involved in that sale process with CGMPC. And prior to that, I was a corporate lawyer. <laughs> okay, okay, we forgive you. Um, tell us a little bit about, about, about the rest of the team. Um, like, who, who's active? Yeah, so um, we've obviously got Steve Blower, who's ex-ISO Energy. He's on the board. He's absolutely fantastic and has had his hand in many, many different discoveries in the basin. Um, and Kanan has just joined us, Kanan Sariaglo, uh, who was working with Fission um, and part of that discovery team. Um, so he's very familiar with basted, hosted uranium discoveries. Um, so they're the two technical guys that we've got. And of course, we're building that team up, that technical team in Canada at the moment. Uh, and then there's myself, obviously, and um, we've got a great board, a very supportive with Richard Pierce, who was previously around the traps uh, in the last uranium boom, Matt Gorsey, who assisted putting this company together, and Ollie Cruiser, who assisted by putting together a prospectivity study over the Athabasca Basin, which is really why we're here today talking. Well, it, that, that, that's great. I just, I just wanted to understand because, you know, um, working in Athabasca, it has, it's, it has its own peculiarities. Um, and so you've got quite a few people who've obviously worked in the Athabasca Basin. That helps. Okay, understood. Um, now t talk to me about the, the, the business plan. So you, you obviously picked this up from uh, ISO Energy, another Aussie, um, uh, you know, Craig, uh, is well known to us, and I think Matt's uh, the the kind of conduit between bet between you two. That's how you picked it up originally. So, um, can you tell us what you set out to try to do? What's the what's the business plan? Yeah, sure. So uh, there hadn't been a ASX exploration uranium listing in ten years. Um, so uh, I was approached at about this time last year, actually, um, and told, well, we potentially are able to pick up these assets in the Athabasca Basin. Um, and obviously the Athabasca Basin has tremendous appeal for any uranium buff out there because it's just really is a well, a, a tier one jurisdiction. So, you know, that got me straight off the bat. And of course, I started looking into ISO Energy and and next gen, um, and they of course had had the Arrow discovery, and and been in love with the previous discovery that I worked for, which was the Husab discovery. I thought, oh my god, the Arrow discovery! This beats Husab hands down. So, um, partly I came along to really put together a company which was exploring purely in the Athabasca Basin, and to really get that uplift in in the uranium price as well on the way through. So. Um, our, our aim and our goal is to explore for basement hosted uranium deposits. So uh, near surface is what we're looking for. And of course, we've had that recent success with uh, the Gemini uh, mineralized zone, um, which we discovered on our fourth hole ever. So that was a pure greenfield exploration play. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, because, you know, when I first um, saw this come out, I thought, oh boy, here we go. We're going to repeat what happened last cycle. We go from 50 companies to 500 companies, most of which were name, name changes and not serious about uh, uranium. They're just taking advantage of the situation. But you get, you put a serious team together, and I think you beat me to it. I was going to say, and you've also made a discovery. So, um, and you made it quite quickly. Was that from data which you inherited from ISO as part of that deal, or was this just, well, I, how did you identify the target and then what, how come you got lucky? So we started with a prospectivity study over the Athabasca Basin, which was a very technically driven prospectivity study. And that alerted us to certain areas in the basin that we were interested in. 
And the Gemini project was one of those particular areas. And we liked the project so much that we pegged a whole a lot of additional ground around the addition of the original asset that we picked up from ISO. So that was the first thing. Then we had obviously historical um, data on the area and there had been previous historical drilling um, and, and some previous exploration, but there really hadn't been anything done since the 1970s. So we saw this as a big opportunity. Um, there were several uranium showings around, um, you know, 12 kilometres south of the Gemini mineralised zone. Uh, there was radioactive boulders. Um, there was also bog uh, sediment sampling and lake sediment samplings between zero and 660 ppm. So for a uranium buff from Namibia, those grades seemed extraordinary to me and, and something that needed follow-up. Um, so, you know, Key Lake is a mine that was originally discovered, um, you know, up ice from uh, radioactive boulders. And we sort of took a very similar exploration approach. We flew a VTEM over uh, the Gemini project. That was really the first thing that we did as a team. And uh, two weeks later, we were using those results and out there drilling. Nice. Uh, can, what, can, what can we expect to see from you? Because I, we, I saw you raise some money, uh, you know, a few months ago, but say just over 7 million Aussie. Um, you, your share price has popped up a, a bit. You, you're going to be able to raise, you know, cheap, cheaper money going forward. But you've also you can only work at a certain speed when you when you when you when you're starting off, or can you? Now you've made a discovery. Does that give you extra impetus? Will we see more money being raised? Do you will you increase the the drill program accordingly? Yeah, so um, great question. We actually recently raised another $7 million. So we've got over $10 million in the bank, which is an extraordinary amount of money for, you know, a, a uranium exploration play. Um, so we will be utilising that money and aggressively drilling the GMZ zone. Um, we've got an initial plan of 6,600 metres, um, but we will expand that program if winter is longer and the drill results, you know, uh, are showing up to be very good. So We've got some excellent plans with the drill rig. Um, we've got one drill that's going to be exclusively on the GMZ zone. And then we've got the second drill rig, which is going to be drilling some old uh, historical, uh, near some old historical drill holes, which actually encountered alteration based on air photo liniments way back in the day. And so they've just missed a conductor very slightly. One of those results even has low levels of uranium mineralization. So we'll be following up on that. That's on the original ISO energy claim. Um, and part of our ISO energy heads of agreement um, is to drill uh, or spend a million dollars on exploration. So that will fulfill that head of agreement um, provision. And then um, we're also going to be drilling the Gemini extension zone, which we're extremely excited about. Um, and that is a 1.8 kilometre along strike to the north. There is a conductor running north and low magnetics. So to us, those low magnetics can be interpreted as alteration in, um, in the ground. And we're hoping to test that theory. And hopefully, you know, Gemini will prove to be an extremely good area. Who knows? Could be the next arrow or triple R. Could be. <laughs> Good thing. Um, one would hope. One would hope. But look, I just, I just want to talk to you about uh, something you just said there, because you know you're going to have to, you are going to get have to have to get used to the, the seasonality component, aren't you? Because Aussie, you've got Africa experience, Athabasca, slightly mm. different. I know you've got the guys in there who've, who've worked it, but you, you're going to have to wrap. You're the you're the person buck stops with you, decision making stops with you. So you're going to have to get used to new data inputs. Um, you know, certainly in, in connection with the seasonality component, when you can drill, you know, the cost of drilling up there, the the, the nature of the drilling up there. It, it's a slightly new world for you as a CEO, isn't it, operating in, in Canada? Look, of course, it's a new world, but this is why you hire fantastic people around you. I mean, really, you couldn't get better people than Steve Flower and Kanan. Kanan, you know, spent the last eight years drilling the Triple R deposit. Um, he's extremely familiar with uh, all of the suppliers in the Athabasca Basin. In fact, we've just hired what everyone considers to be the number one drilling team in the Athabasca Basin, Bryson Drillers. 
um, and they're going to be coming out on site. Um, in fact, they did a site visit with us recently when I was over in Canada. So, you know, we've got excellent team, excellent suppliers, and, you know, we've got a pretty tight budget, which we'll manage pretty closely. Yeah, um, and just so, so staying, on, staying on the same theme, it's obviously now, is this the first time you've been a CEO of a public company? I know you've had the role as a company secretary, but CEO, first time? Uh, first time CEO of a public company, yes. Uh, not first time CEO. Right. Okay. Okay. But it, therefore, but public and pu private, two, two, two very different sets of um, needs there. So, I mean, how, how are you finding that? I mean, who are you getting advice from on, on that front? Because I, I guess you were the person maybe issuing and, and proffering advice uh, to other CEOs, but it's a slightly different seat you're sitting in now. How are you finding it? Look, I'm, I'm finding it fantastic. I absolutely love it. Um, I love exploration. I love the uranium market. I love what we're doing. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's a fantastic journey and I'm really enjoying it. And I mean, honestly, who gets a discovery fourth hole in? It's just absolutely fantastic result for the company. Um, and so, you know, when we have great technical results like that, it's, it makes it much easier. It does. My role is much easier. It does. It does. It does. Uh, not many people make discoveries full stop, let alone early. Uh, so, yeah, I think congratulations on that one. Um, with regards to the ISO component, um, obviously you picked it up from them. What, what, tell me more about that deal structure. What do, they, what do they own as a result? How much do you owe them? You know, how does that play out? Yeah, so ISO Energy uh, received 16% um, uh, of the company when we listed um, during the IPO. Um, so they're currently a 14% shareholder in the company. Um, and our obligation was to spend a million dollars um, over the ISO Energy areas. We've almost fulfilled those commitments already. Um, and, um, and, and that's pretty much it. There is a 2% NSR which is a, a royalty attached to the ISO energy areas. Um, who's who, that who's got that? not where the discovery is. Who, who's, huh? who, who owns that? That's ISO energy. They've kept the NSR on the, on the property, but it, you yes. say it, it's not included in the discovery area. It's not. So the discovery area is actually an area that we pegged after the ISO energy agreement. Oh, yeah. wow. That's quite nice. <laughs> Double, double, yes. double lucky. Well done. Um, okay, so it, it, obviously the the you, the timing couldn't be better for you in terms of you know when you're entering entering the space in terms of the uh, interest in the uranium uh, investing. Obviously with Sprott, Sprott's contribution to bringing or shedding new light um, in the sector too, and obviously uh, Kazas and Prom obviously helping along the way and. I think even uh, Yellow Cake in, in London as, as, as well, having this sort of financial uh, synthetic o o overlay that they they are, are able to perhaps expedite things in, in the space. So do you feel that you've timed it right? Or were you just looking to try and get in um, and let the thing play out? I mean, could you see any of this coming? Uh, look, I mean, we did time it very perfectly. Uh, we obviously had an internal... Um, thought process that the uranium market was about to turn and then of course sprut into the market or sput into the market and completely changed you know the short term dynamics of the market by whipping out all of those uh extra pounds of uranium so that's done a tremendous amount for the spot price um increasing it from $30 at the beginning of the year to $45 where it's sitting now um but you know the uranium fundamentals they were always there um, irrespective of, of, of Sprott entering the market. Um, and, and it was really the supply shortfall that was really fascinating to me. Um, obviously, there's been a 10-year lack of exploration and development in the area. And eventually, you know, uh, companies, uh, you know, they, they start to go through their supplies. So, um, and then, of course, the demand story, you know, with decarbonisation, electrification. I mean, you couldn't get better sort of um, global trends for the uranium market. And then you add in, you know, what's happened over in Europe with the um, el electricity crisis over there. I mean, it's all just playing beautifully into the story for uranium long-term fundamentals. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the great thing about the market. It's very much driven supply demand. Yeah. 
It's a great time to be in it. Yeah, we, we, we have a, a weekly uh, uranium, well, it's an energy show, but mostly talk about uh, uranium and nuclear on there. And obviously, the, all those thematics uh, are regularly discussed and questions th- thrown around. So I think it does come back to that timing component. And not, I think the interesting thing is that the narrative has, has changed because the fundamentals have been there for a, a long time. I think things have been expedited by Sput, Sprott coming in and, um, you know, throwing a lot of money and, and, and I say, taking out a lot of mobile inventory. So that's, that's, all, that's all kind of good news. But look at you. You're still, though, a 30 million market cap company, right? So you've had a, you've just started out, out of the gates. You've had a good reaction to the share price. You've made a discovery. You've been able to raise money on a, a couple of times out, out of the gate and more recently in the uh, end of September. What next? How, how do you, how can you accelerate in the way that perhaps others who have been loitering for the last 10 years, waiting for something to happen? How, how can you kind of, you know, beat, beat them to the punch as it were? Look, I mean, from my previous experience at Extract, um, that went from a discovery uh, to a resource, to a DFS, to a mining licence within a very short period of time. And that was aggressive drilling that got them there, essentially. So, you know, I would like to repeat that process and and hopefully drill as aggressively as we possibly can with with the budget that we're able to drill with. Um, So that's that's the first step is defining a resource if we're fortunate enough, of course, to, um, you know, have a very successful follow up drill program at the GMZ. So, so talk to me about timing though, because it's always important. Some, some people rush into those things and, you know, get a main resource out early. Others want to drill to the edge of the envelope and prove this, the scale of this thing. So, you know, Aussies and North Americans have, t- you know, t- very different business models from that point of view. You've half your team are North American and you've got the Aussie contingent. So when you say replicate the model, what do you, what do you mean by that in terms of timing? I mean, we will drill as quickly as the seasons allow us, um, and as and you know, if if the zone only allows you to have a certain number of drill rigs, we'll obviously only have that certain number of drill rigs. So we'll drill drill within the ability that we're able to drill. Um, but you know, we will be as aggressive as we can for the market timing because I think what's important to look at is over the last ten years, you know companies probably were acting more slowly because there wasn't funding behind them to be able to really be aggressive. Yeah, um, but you don't, have, you don't have that problem. Now, funding yeah. is there. Yeah, it, 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 it is there. And I'm just wondering, you know, what, what are the learn- – I'm just trying to understand this of the psyche, your psyche, because you've got to do the drilling and you also got to play to the market, right? And there will be new entrants coming in, you know, you know, lots of white noise uh, coming down the line um, that you'll have to contend with at some point, presumably. But for, for now, you've made a discovery – looks good you know whether the be, be by luck or design it's, it's kind of irrelevant you've made a discovery where others um you know have taken a lot longer and spent a lot more money to do so so that's good news um but the drilling bit will hopefully continue to deliver you know good data for you to be able to utilize but how do you play the market because we've seen some great athabasca stories you know go from 100 100 Million market cap to nearly a billion, and and others gone beyond. Um, and so they've done it in different ways, right? Uh, they've been quite cute. They've been quite innovative, and some of some of them just been we're just all about the, the the drilling. And then we've had others languishing because maybe the stories are tired. Maybe people you know you know are not enamored by them. They they prefer the new things coming through. So where where do you set yourself in in, in there? And how do you access North American cash? So, you know, there's a, there's a lot to play, uh, a lot to think about with regards to how you play the markets, not just the drilling component. Yeah, look, I mean, there's a lot of big funds um, within the Australian and Asian part of the world. Um, and of course, as you get bigger, you start to do more and more roadshows globally because uranium is absolutely a global commodity. Um, So, you know, I've got very good connections in London from my time at Extract, obviously Kalahari, which was our major shareholder then, was listed on AIM and and part of our corporate office was based in London in those days. So I've got some good connections in London. Um, Obviously, we're in the Athabasca Basin. Um, 
And so, you know, it's, it's going to be easy to talk to investors in, in North America because people understand the Athabasca Basin. And I think, you know, people will follow a story if the discovery is good. And, that, and that's what I hope it is, you know. Um, so, you know, I always get, go back to the example of extract, but it, 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 it did take the market a little bit of time to work out just how truly extraordinary the HUSAB uranium deposit was. Um, but once they did, you know, the market cap was $2 billion. Yeah, some, yeah some, and, and there continue to be some great uh, Namibian um, uranium stories um, out there. But you're, you're, in a, you're in a different place um, from that. You know, I think London, Australia, um, there's a certain audi- audience for that. You know, the, the you know, if you've got uh, an African asset, both those countries understand African assets. You're in North America. Have, have, have North American investors got access to your, your stock? Because I think as uranium picks up again, I suspect it will in, in, in Q1, are they going to be able to buy your stock? Well, at this point in time, we're only listed on the ASX. Um, but of course, if it's appropriate down the track, we would look at whether it might be appropriate for a dual listing. Um, so again, I go back to the story of extract that was dual listed on the TSX. So it is a possibility and, you know, it is that dual structure that I'm familiar with working with. So it's something that's doable for sure. And, you know, that's why we're using, uh, for example, Canaccord did our last raise because they've got really great links into that North American market. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're trying to set ourselves up as, as well as we possibly can should this be a significant discovery. Um, but again, we need to really do the drilling this time round to really know exactly where we're placed. We really won't know until the truth serum, which is the drill rig, goes into the ground and starts drilling again. At the moment, we've only got one hole. And of course, Baseload, who's 400 metres away from us, has, you know, three holes. So, you know, we know the system is large. We know it's a big mineralized system, but we don't know much more than that. So any teaming up with Baseload? We had James on last week. He seemed quite excited about what they've got. Well, James is certainly excited. And, you know, of course, uh, they're our neighbours. So, you know, we've met up and and uh, their geologists and my geologists, we're all very excited. Um, and I think Baseload has been very lucky uh, off the back of this discovery to be able to go and pull a drill rig over and actually, you know, drill. Um, they're very, very lucky to actually have had a drill rig on site at the time. So, um, look... You know, uh, we'll always talk with our neighbours. Um, who knows? I think both of us just need to concentrate on what we're doing this time around, concentrate on the drilling um, and really uh, put in a good effort to drill as much as we possibly can this winter program. Okay. No running before you you can walk, right? Exactly. Good stuff. Siobhan, really enjoyed that chat. Nice uh, introduction to your new story um, we'll be looking out for more drill results from you. Um, stay in touch. Let us know how you get on. Thanks. And I should say the drill rig starts turning early to mid-January, so stay tuned.